When people think of electric vehicles, they often think of shiny toys for rich people. Transportation planners, particularly some that I like watching on YouTube, often dismiss EVs as a distraction to the real work that is needed to improve transportation. But electric vehicles are quietly becoming relevant to a wider and wider range of applications in both the global north as well as the developing world. So today, I want to explore the roles of electric vehicles. And I'm going to argue that not only should transportation planners care about EVs, but they should even view them as perhaps the single most important tool we have to combat transport-related climate emissions. Welcome to Transit World, videos on all things transportation with a focus on the developing world. Before we jump in, a really big disclaimer up front. I do work as an electric vehicle consultant. You may think that my views are biased by my job, and eh, that may be true, but I entered and now work in the electric vehicle industry because I really do believe in the potentials of EVs, not the other way around. I could potentially benefit in some super broad way by promoting EVs, but let's be honest, most of the clients that I work with and may work with in the future, are never gonna see this video. And EVs are already a lightning hot topic. It's not like the industry needs some random low budget YouTube video to boost interest in electric vehicles. Most people are already really excited by electric vehicles and their potential, but the transport planning group is a hard constituency to convince. And hey, I'm a transit nerd at heart, and I agree pretty much on everything that other transit and urban planners on YouTube have to say and comment, but I do think my views in this video might be the one big exception to that. As you ready your angry comments, please do remember that I'd rather be riding a subway or a bike than driving an EV, and at its core, I'm desperately cheering for public transit, walking, biking, and other kinds of active transportation to win more in this world. So let's zoom way out and talk about transportation very broadly. What is the purpose of transportation planning? I really think that there are three big things and they all overlap. The first is to improve accessibility. Get more people able to move more places in less time with less resources. The second is to improve the health and the quality of life. So have cities that are built in such a way that they are safe and enjoyable to navigate for everybody. And the third is to reduce emissions, which is where I'm going to focus a lot of this conversation about the value add of EVs. And out of these three purposes to transportation planning, I really do think that most transportation planners and enthusiasts do care about all, but care most about the first two, improving accessibility and quality of life. You may disagree, but I do think that there's more people interested in improving urban form and allowing for more people to get around more efficiently than there are people that care about reducing emissions. And that's fine. I'm kind of the same way, as I think is likely true for most of the other YouTubers on transport topics. I'm more excited about a new bus line opening up than I am about some new bus line becoming electric. I'm not really going to like a commuter rail more or less based on its propulsion system, I care a lot more about the headways and the span of service. But the transportation sector is responsible for 24% of CO2 emissions from fuel combustion globally. And it's one of the fastest growing emission sources. Any successful strategy to combat climate change needs to focus on decarbonizing transportation. So I'm gonna organize my thoughts here on electric vehicles based on a common and well-used construct called the Avoid, Shift, Improve framework. The basic idea is that transportation should first and foremost prioritize avoiding motorized vehicle miles traveled by reducing distances between trips, using a non-motorized form of transit, or chaining trips together. Then the secondary priority would be shifting travel to more efficient motorized modes such as carpooling or using public transport, etc. And then, if you can't do the first two, you should improve the way you fuel your vehicles to make them as clean as possible. Many of my transport planner friends quip that they work on the two priority areas, avoid and shift, while I just muddle along on the last one, but I disagree. 
So here are my three main reasons that I think electric vehicles are critical to combating climate change and improving the broad sustainability of transportation. The first is that avoiding and shifting can only do so much. We're really at a race against the clock here. We need to, according to the latest studies on the topic, really make a sizable impact in combating climate change in about the next decade or so. Even if the amount of public transit, biking, and carpooling all doubled in the next 10 years, doubled, you would still have over a third of most trips taking place in private cars in most cities in the world. In places like the US, that would be over half of all the trips. And yes, China and Europe and many other countries are slightly better, but they're not that much better. And I think most would agree, a doubling in sustainable mode share in 10 years would represent a just fantastic, incredible revolutionary success in transportation planning. Yet, even if we were able to pull that off somehow, the carbon impact of introducing EVs to replace single occupancy vehicles would still be greater in most geographies. Plus, the trends are really going in the opposite direction in most countries. Global GDP rise and shifting patterns in the wake of COVID have led mostly to an increase in private vehicle use, not to less. I'm not arguing this is a good thing. In fact, I hate this stat, but I think we need to face the music. This is what we actually are looking at. And you might be thinking, well, post COVID, more people are also working from home. That's true, but many can't or don't want to do that. And this has also broadly led people that are working from home to move farther away from city centers, typically to more car dependent locales. And even though they might not be commuting, they're still taking discretionary trips, which typically represent more than 50% of total trips. People often criticize electric vehicles because they have little to no effect on reducing congestion or improving the urban form. You've probably seen some version of this illustration, and it's a common point of dissent that my friends make against me all the time. And it's true, EVs are not going to get rid of congestion. But for a slew of reasons that really deserve their own video, nothing is going to get rid of congestion, especially in the next 10 years. So we really need to deal with the emissions of this congestion. And the only practical way to do that is through electrifying those vehicles that are stuck in traffic. And as much as I fully support shifting people over to public transit as much as possible, we need to remember that public transit also pollutes both local contamination and greenhouse gases, especially in the developing world where there's a prominence of informal or semi-formal fleets. For example, before Bogota formalized their bus network into Transmilenio, the buses accounted for less than 5% of the total vehicles in the city, but were responsible for 23% of all the CO2 emissions and 40% of all the nitrous oxide vehicle emissions. Gran Santiago, despite the formalization of the system in 2007, still accounts for 50% of all NOx emissions and a really large percentage of the CO2 in the corridor that it travels. And before Shenzhen became the first city to completely electrify their bus fleet, their buses comprised only a half a percent of the vehicles in the city, but were responsible for 25% of the city's transportation associated energy and 20% of the CO2 emissions associated with vehicles. The second reason I think EVs should be taken seriously is because the improved lever of the avoid shift improve framework is really where you can make the most immediate reductions in carbon emissions. Time is really essential. Like I said, we've got roughly a decade to get this right. And there are market ready options that you can buy at scale right now when it comes to electric vehicles. Yes, they typically do have a higher upfront capital cost, but they're increasingly penciling out for more and more applications due to their operating savings. And I know what some of you might be thinking, yes, electric vehicles do noticeably reduce emissions compared to their fossil fuel counterparts. No, they're not perfectly zero emission, since you do have to construct the vehicle, especially the battery, which requires the burning of fuels at factories and mines and the extraction of resources. And you also have to harness the electricity, which depending on where you are, can be more or less carbon intense. But even with those considerations, electric vehicles still offer a large carbon reduction over their combustion counterparts, even in most places where the grid is not perfectly clean. And these reductions will improve over time as the grid becomes cleaner. 
Electric vehicles also last longer since they have only one moving part compared to the 2000 or so in a conventional gas vehicle. Batteries are likely to be the limiting factors in an electric vehicle's life, but they are increasingly being built so that they can be easily swapped out and then used in a second life application such as stationary energy storage. And the third reason I think EVs are relevant is perhaps the most fascinating one of all and the hardest one to win people over on. I think that electric vehicles can, at least in some way, help with the avoid and shift components of transportation planning. For the most part, yes, EVs are just the same old vehicles as before, they just happen to run on batteries, but they do have some unique elements that could potentially allow transportation planners new opportunities to reshape driving behaviors and patterns. Perhaps the most mature one is vehicle to grid integration. Electric vehicles are essentially big batteries on wheels, and you can discharge those batteries back to the grid at select times to help stabilize the grid and reduce peak load. This can help transportation planning as well. By setting up a program to pay drivers to stay plugged in to the grid during peak hours, which would heavily encourage them to avoid or shift their trips. Initial studies have indicated that this business case actually does pencil out. The average EV could receive revenue between $1,000 and $3,000 per year if they participated in such a program. Another way we could broadly improve transportation planning through the introduction of EV policies is by strategically placing charging to discourage driving in dense or central locations. A policy that places affordable and plentiful charging on the periphery of your city and little or expensive charging in desirable areas for walking and biking would discourage people from driving into dense neighborhoods and encourage them to keep cars away from priority areas and walk or take public transit instead. This might sound like a crazy idea, but it's actually being piloted right now, at least in part, in Portland, where they've implemented a policy of, amongst other things, discouraging charging within three miles of their downtown core. The introduction of electric vehicles could also lead to better separation of freight operations from other street users by allowing trucks to deliver in the middle of the night or in confined spaces, things that are often prohibited now because of the noise and air pollution concerns of conventional vehicles. So before I wrap up here, I do want to just leave a quick reminder to please drop a like if you're a transit nerd that watches these types of videos and has decided you now completely agree that EVs are much more important than all the stuff you actually care about in the transport sector. And consider subscribing to get updates on other topics that may or may not be as controversial, but are always interesting, at least for me. And please consider a contribution to my Patreon if you happen to like the content. And consider a nasty comment below if you don't. Both will help the channel grow in their own small ways. I want to end with a few kind of so what thoughts and a bit of a call to action. First, this isn't a zero sum game. We can work on avoiding and shifting and improving transportation all at the same time. But my main point is that we actually do all at the same time and we don't just brush aside the improved part. Electric vehicles are not a silver bullet, but they're also not just a distraction or a toy for rich people. They have a real and important role in making transportation more sustainable, mostly to combat climate change in the near to medium term, but potentially also to help change the way we think about private car use in the longer term. EVs do need political and economic support to take off in time. I do think electric vehicles are ultimately inevitable, but their arrival in time to notably impact climate change is not. Even the most aggressive global projections forecast a global EV market share of around, eh, give or take 10% by 2030. And at this rate, let's just be brutally honest, the transition to zero emission transport is unlikely to happen in time to keep global temperature rise below 1.5 or even two degrees Celsius. So it's not a waste of money to provide purchase incentives and to subsidize charging infrastructure. And this is precisely what my call to action perhaps is to those that are watching. Simply put, support electric vehicle incentives, support the improved part of the ASI framework, even if you don't generally support vehicles. 
That's all I've got for today. Thanks again for watching. Look forward to talking next time about a completely different topic. Until next time.